नमस्कार ए वार्म वेलकम टू ऑल ऑफ यू टू दिस अवेयरनेस प्रोग्राम ऑन कॉन्स्टिट्यूशन डे संविधान दिवस व्हिच इज बीइंग ऑर्गेनाइज्ड बाय ईस्टर्न जोनल कल्चरल सेंटर अंडर द ऑस्पिशियस ऑफ मिनिस्ट्री ऑफ कल्चर गवर्नमेंट ऑफ इंडिया आज वी नो एवरी ईयर ऑन 26th नवंबर दिस कॉन्स्टिट्यूशन डे इज सेलिब्रेटेड थ्रू आउट इंडिया टू कमेमोरेट द एडॉप्शन ऑफ आवर कॉन्स्टिट्यूशन and as everybody knows on 26th november 1949 the constituent assembly just uh, adopted this constitution and it came into effect on 26th january 1950 and to commemorate all these things every year this is uh, organized this is uh, uh, celebrated in different ways and uh, this time we are very much delighted to have in our midst eminent luminaries in the department of education and research we are very much uh, glad that major professor kirod prasad mahanti is with us uh, as we know he is uh, the founder vice chancellor of north odisha university baripada and he is uh, one of the leading experts on parliamentary affairs and uh, a columnist and an educationist par excellence uh, he is one of our experts uh, in this uh, discussion over digital interface and we are very much elated to have in our midst, midst professor sarath kumar dora who is a renowned uh, educationist and at present he is uh, working as head of the department political science in pranath autonomous college one of the leading degree colleges of the state and he has a number of publications uh, which have been published in different journals of national and international repute and uh, he has been writing columns for different newspapers as well and we are very much uh, delighted to have dr prabhat kumar das who is uh, at present associate professor in the department of political science ketrabasi dev college nirakarpur one of the premier degree colleges of the state and to his credit he has uh, contributed immensely uh, to different journals and uh, chauvinists of national and international repute and uh, so many scholars are getting his guidance uh, to pursue research in different universities uh so we start the discussion with uh, uh, major professor kirod kumar mahanti uh, as we know that uh, constitution our constitution is the largest uh, constitution in the world uh, professor mahanti how do you evaluate our constitution thank you professor arth you know i will take one minute to thank eastern rural council and cultural center they are organizing they have made such things and they have associated us to take part in because this is a significant thing you know not only the bathroom constitution which we observe to the six but this is a, our independence you know that amrit mahotsav is being had so this is a thing i know professor rat with the moderator I know Dr. Sanjeev Dora. I know Dr. Pigas. They are very eminent scholars, so they are the panelists. And uh, when they are sitting with me, I feel very elated. And I would like to speak about the Constitution. You know, unless there is a Constitution for democracy, that cannot be termed as democracy. Without the Constitution, because I say. Very simply, I will define what is constitution. Constitution is the basic law of the country, supreme law of the country. If a country fails to achieve these two things, regarding that constitution, then that be some other form of government not democracy. In India, we have the constitution, and the draft of the constitution took some time. Very even jurist and even in political personalities. take part in it and i would like to tell you there is a difference you know one man ivor jennings at a time he was writing the constitution for other those countries they did not have that position but ivor jennings was drafting constitution for them and they adopted it but in india is a very uh, you know important thing the constitution constitution assembly was set up the members took part in it discussed in length and they come to the conclusion that they adopted it 
is a great thing. Sometimes people raise a question. By the way, I just want to refer to you. That why it was not referred to the people? Why they, uh, who assigned them to accept this constitution? Because in the name of constitution, they are not elected. Because in the name of the constitution, assembly, they were not elected. They were elected to the parliament. So they turned themselves to the constitution assembly. But I will give an answer. It's a vast country. Large populations. It is such a country with, you know, multipolar um, groups. To have an election for constituent assembly, then wait for it. Then there is a deadline fixed by, uh, you know, British government, foreign government. It was to give us independence. If we fail in their target, they will not give us independence. So we are all anxious. So then nine people have worked and they have after the constitution and accepted it. It is not a throw. And it is a beautiful constitution. We have borrowed from other constitutions. But without borrowing, we have uh, maintained our identity. We have made our constitution the basic law of the country and supreme law of the country. All other laws have been all scrapped. Constitution has superseded everybody. So I hope when they are celebrating its birthday. It's a pleasure if we touch it and respect it because unless we have some emotions with that constitution, nothing will achieve. Thank you. Uh, rightly you have mentioned that uh, our constitution is one of its kind and uh, in your evaluation our constitution has proved its uh, uh, speciality uh, which is uh, just uh, being the pioneer for the other countries and uh, particularly Indian constitution has its uh, efficacy, has its uh, uh, special impact in the constitution of the other countries as well. Uh, now uh, we move to Dr. Prabhat Kumar Das. Uh, Dr. Das, we see that uh, the constituent assembly just worked hard as uh, it is uh, known that. But uh, how can you say that uh, how the constituent assembly worked hard uh, for the finalization of the constitution? It was actually a very Herculean task on the part of the Constituent Assembly to frame the constitution within a stipulated period of time. And there was immense pressure on them to finalize it. So drafting committee actually decided to make it in a very big way. And they systematically arranged every clause. They made it a point to touch upon each and every aspect. Uh, of ruling of this country in future so that there won't be any problem. So by that time they developed a systematic, open and consensual manner to have the constitution and to make it very clear so that uh, things will not be uh, difficult for the future rulers to rule this uh, state. So they arranged it, they made it very simple, they framed it clause by clause they have guided everything, so they discussed. When they discussed everything, it was known as the constitutional debates. It was lengthy and so many amendments were made. Each and every word spelt by them is being recorded. And all those recording kind of things were considered to be the golden words that were spelt by them. So what they did at that time, they made it voluminous. So 12 volumes actually came out and finally they have drafted it. It's a very big one and they uh, try to make it uh, within the limited articles covering all aspects of the uh, constitution and uh, by that way they took uh, a lot of pain uh, for that and as a result of which we see the constitution today that is resilient and it is only the effort of such kind of people who have drafted it, the members of the Constituent Assembly, they made it very clear to make it a big one. And that is my take on it. Uh, on this Constitution Day, we fondly remember the great people who have drafted our Constitution and uh, rightly you have mentioned all the aspects uh, of that question. Dr. Dora, we find that the preamble is very much associated with our Constitution and it is an integral part of our Constitution. Why is the preamble so important? Preamble, that is an introductory statement in a constitution. 
been inspired by American model, our constitutional makers, they wanted to start our constitution from the preamble. It can be said as the preface of the constitution. It is said that preamble that, that is just the key of the constitution. It is also told that soul of the constitution. From the preamble, in nutshell, we can know the aims and objectives of our constitution. It is also a measuring rod through which we measure the worth or dignity of our constitution. Our constitution has begun, our preamble has begun from we, the people of India, from the words we, the people of India. In the constituent assembly, there was also a debate with these words. Some suggested that it would have been better to start with the preamble from the words like in the name of God. After a hot discussion, so it was decided and constitution in preamble, it started from we the people of India. In order to clarify and in order to say that people, our source of authority or power is with the people. There is popular sovereignty in India. Ultimately, power has been vested down in the hands of the people. So, containing 85 words, our preamble, so speaks about or it has been reserved to make India basically into a sovereign, democratic, republican state and subsequently in 42nd Constitutional Amendment Act 1976, another two words have been incorporated like secular and socialistic. And in course of time, in the same preamble, so all our constitutional matters in Norse, we can know how it has been highlighted or the constitutional matters has been reflected in the preamble like we have given weightage to liberty, we have given weightage to equality, to fraternity, to justice, all these words and finally, so regarding the date of adaptation of our present constitution. And preamble in general. So basically, it talks about the matters as detailed discussed in our preamble. We can know very well what are the contents of our constitution, what matters have been highlighted in our constitution. And the credibility, almost many countries of the world, they have made their constitution accordingly, starting with the preamble of India. So from the preamble, it is like a mirror through which the face of the constitution is reflected. You know, rightly indicated that how preamble is so important in our constitution. Uh, Major Mahanti, we find that uh, uh, since 1950, we have been uh, ruled by, in this Republic of India, we have been ruled by this constitution, it is uh, right to say. So why do we need a constitution? We need a constitution, I already explained to you, that Constitution is the basic law of the country. Without constitution, the governance is not possible. To govern this country, the people, huge people, there should be always a constitution. I would like to add Dr. Thora's statement. He has mentioned about sovereign democratic liberty. A sovereign democratic republic is preamble. You know how the story. At a time, the members of the Constituent Assembly, they were feeling that some ruler, successor of either Hindu kings or Muslim kings or Black kings, if their successor is there, he will be the you know, emperor or king of India with the same status of uh, crown in England. But that was rejected, nobody accepted it. At a time, I remember that British head was visiting us and there was two also publications in the newspaper that when Dr. Ajahn Prasad we welcome him, welcome her, we'll borrow him and uh, we'll uh, receive him. That also rejected people laughed. India is a sovereign democratic people. How can you uh, bend uh, down in the presence of the British Queen, so that was also not accepted. So, constitution that important, and uh, you know, a, as he said, this preamble is the basic document, this amendment, 42nd amendment, 
el socialista, el circular y propietario, es muy importante. Y uno, de si tú se conoce a Nau, es el problema. Y es el, y su día, en otros lugares, me he dicho, de cuando yo subí a Nau, no le entro. Ahora le subí a Nau, ¿qué es? ¿Qué es posible? Violence is needed also in many things. Suppose a crowd is unruly. To control the violence will occur. So all these things should be considered. But what I feel, I still am very boast of our constitution. A great document, a sacred document. Its part this should be observed throughout the country. It's the only, I remember, as I know, that only schools and colleges disagree. But others do not and come to picture. Now, a, a, a farmer in the field, anybody, a laborer in the industries, factories, he must know his constitution, must know his rights, know his duties, because that is the most important thing. I will, I will just give you another example. There was an emergency. There was an emergency in 75. And in the emergency, you know, many rights were taken away by the government. People are concerned. Constitutional rights are being taken up. In the name of emergency. In the name of emergency, they were taken away. But the government has no right to take it up. Yeah. Uh, rightly, Major Mahanti has indicated that constitution safeguards our rights and ensures our duty as well. Uh, Professor Dora, we find that uh, at times it is alleged that our constitution has got the size of uh, as elephant times size and it is uh, uh, made bulky. So why is it alleged so? So it is said that the elephant size of our constitution, when we see to it, basically as Dr. Das was telling, so while uh, preparing or drafting the constitution of India, so thoroughly they have said it and they have incorpor uh, incorporated many laws which will be very much suitable for the Indian people, citizen. And as since 300, basically 395 articles were there in our Indian constitution. In all other countries of the world, so such number or figure is not found, number one. So within 395 articles in our Indian constitution, there is a detailed discussion, every bit of law has been incorporated, like our Indian Service, Public Service Commission, like other commission, civil class, civil right commission, everything it is not late. Everything has been discussed in our Indian constitution, starting from fundamental rights to all other commissions. So it has made the size of our constitution bulky, or it is also said that it is elephant of size in its size. That is the reason. So it has been elaborately discussed. Every law has been incorporated in our constitution. Uh, but it's elaborated uh, size uh, although it is uh, uh, alleged or although it is criticized by some, but in fact it ensures our rights, our fundamental rights and our responsibility and duty to the nation as well. Uh, and uh, Dr. Das, uh, it is fine that uh, Dr. B. R. Ambedkar, Baba Sahib, Nimrav Ambedkar, uh, is uh, considered to be the father of uh, Indian constitution. So what made him uh, to be elevated to the uh, position of a father of the constitution? Well, uh, it is drafted by the constituent assembly and constituent assembly was composed of the people of India and it was outcome of the parliamentary uh, dictate of the British government which they actually wanted that they, there should be a constitution. And uh, when the constitution, they, they tried to frame the constitution, they actually wanted that uh, uh, Sardar Patel, uh, Jawaharlal Nehru and Rajendra Prasad, all great people were there who actually uh, they are very interested and keen to see how the constitution actually um, was drafted. And they tried to give a shape to it, but the final responsibility laid on the drafting committee. Actually, drafting committee was a, a committee which was composed of very eminent luminaries and jurists like Dr. B. R. Ambedkar, Ayengar. Uh, Shapru and uh, 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 and Rajendra Prasad also. So when Baba Sahib Ambedkar actually took the pain of taking all those things together and giving a focus 
on the constitution and what to be written, what is to be drafted and how far it, is, it will fit to the people of this country and how things will run in the future. So his vision actually uh, worked a lot and by virtue of his vision, this drafting committee uh, could able to uh, produce such a voluminous and big constitution which now we see today and that is the result uh, for Babasar Ramadka to earn the uh, title of father of the constitution. Yeah, uh, nicely you have told and uh, uh, Major Bhanti, we find that uh, our fundamental rights are ensured by our constitution and uh, it is seen that our constitution has undergone uh, number of times, uh, number of amendments have been made uh, in it and uh, uh, the question rises that are our fundamental rights unamendable? You know it is amendable. It will not remain as unamendable. I tell you that right to property has been amended, abrogated from the seven groups of uh, fundamental rights that is not there. But I would like to tell you because we are probably forgetting one thing. When our constitution was in the making, we thought of independence of whole India. Yeah. But the, that cabinet was some plan. That, uh, you know, what happened, you know, it was decided that there were two countries, Hindustan and India. So the, they went away from us. There was a separate constitution assembly for Pakistan. So all our ideas, think, thinking, process in the mind, Changed. Once every time they decided, Congress, which was fighting for the independence, they were deciding that centre should be less powerful, states should be more powerful. Even they were thinking of regional governments. But all these exercises were futile. After this partition, the horrible violence, the killing of people, you know, they changed. Now, mm, you know, the change in such a manner that the center has become very powerful, states have become not powerful. Now we might be knowing that states are also growing. They want more powers. They want many things. But is it possible because you cannot go beyond the constitution? Constitution, whatsoever it has said, federalism. Because our federalism is very good. You know, in Soviet Union, Russia, all Russia, federalism can be dissolved. New federation can come up. But in our constitution, the provision is there. Once the federation is formed, it remains intact. Tact. So fundamental rights, in an emergency we found liberty, right to freedom of speech, right, freedom of press were all there. They are not uh, desirable. Yeah. And, yeah, this means we should be very careful about it. Right to life was also not directly um, affected, but in such a manner the movement went. I have told you, Mr. President, the one very great leader was there. He possibly um, went to the family welfare measures. And uh, many people out of here and all that died, ran away from the police, that will not be. But he was doing it in different cause. So such things should not be there. Because our people know we have a constitution, we have fundamental rights, we have directed principles of state policy, we are our guardians, we are our everybody. And, and we are set in the country of India where there is a constitution which is very, very inviolable. We must respect it and we must treat as sacrosanct. Our constitution is sacrosanct, as uh, rightly you have mentioned, uh, uh, Dr. Dora. We find that the fundamental rights uh, uh, that are uh, considered to be quite important for the citizens of uh, this country, for the citizens of India. Uh, why do uh, our people have such faith in uh, constitution and uh, they want that or they make it sure that fundamental rights are ensured, fundamental rights are executed because of our constitution. So rights and duties are correlated. There are two sides of one coin. 
So all the fundamental rights as incorporated in our constitution, they have been reflected in part 3 of our Indian constitution, starting from article 14 to 32. So being inspired by the American constitution or the constitution of UK, our constitutional makers say the thought of incorporating such fundamental rights in the Indian constitution also. In Indian constitution, the fundamental rights given to the people. So it shows that many minimum or fundamental rights in shape of power, it has been given to the people. Like Article 14, right to equality, right to freedom. These are our fundamental rights starting from Article 14, right to equality. As it says, all are equal in the eyes of law, irrespective of caste, color, creed, sex, etc. Or Article 15, it talks about there can be no discrimination. Exactly like that, in case of for all people, there can be no discrimination. So there is right to freedom, there is right against exploitation, there is right to religion, there are educational rights, and there was also initially the right to property, which has been abolished now, and finally, in Article 32, so constitutional right remedies has been given. When our fundamental rights are violated, so people have that right to take the help of the court or we, we say it as all the fundamental rights are enforceable. To give that faith to the people, so these fundamental rights definitely it will empower the people or it will encourage them, they would have that trust or faith on the constitution or on the law of the country so that equally they are also empowered to utilize their powers, all these fundamental rights will encourage them to be entrusted with the state activities or to feel that all the rights and privileges that they, that they have been enjoying has been ensured by the constitution. They are clearly safeguarded, secured or guaranteed by our Indian constitution. This is what the credibility of the fundamental rights. Dr. Das, what are the institutional arrangements made to rule this country? Actually, the constitution has prescribed uh, in a very clear term, in the legal language, what should be the arrangement to rule this country. Foremost important is that when we see the constitution or we read the constitution or we go by the articles, we find it very difficult. But actually, it described entire things and the division of power, how the country should be ruled, who should rule, and what is the voting system, how the representatives are elected, how parliamentary democracy will run in this country, and how the representation of the people will be made properly, so that there won't be a chance on the part of the uh, people to raise their eyebrows on the uh, administration. So they have uh, elaborately arranged and they made provisions in such a way that they have clear cut made distinction between executive, legislature, judiciary and how the three elements of this uh, government, they are actually coping with each other and making simultaneous checks and balances and what is the limit of the ruling and how the people will get the maximum benefit out of this uh, ruling and out of this constitutional mandate. Important is that as per the mandate, the constitution of India actually guarantees uh, the institutional arrangement so that we are facing uh, no problem uh, till today. We don't have transgress of power and if at all there is uh, any uh, uh, doubt arises, there is another mechanism which can check the first one. And simultaneously it goes and goes on and on. That is the spirit. And actually I adhered to that. Uh, so when all the institutional arrangements are made, we find that till today we don't have such problem and there is no transgress of the power. Actually sometimes we feel that uh, a particular organ of the government is actually bypassing the second one or the third one, which is of course not in reality. 
rather it is coping with each other and this is the beauty of our constitution and we do uh, have that much of capacity to adopt each other and to go in a line so that people will get the maximum benefit and that is the uh, rule where actually the state governs itself for the people and uh, that is the most beautiful part which I can have. Uh, rightly you have mentioned Dr. Das uh, that our constitution facilitates better governance and that is why uh, we pay respect to our constitution and uh, Major Mahanti, we find that uh, in spite of uh, innumerable checks and balances and with all elaborate provision, uh, do you feel that uh, the people of India, uh, the people of uh, the citizens of India, uh, they are safe? Do you feel so? I would like to answer this question. The people of India with fundamental rights, they are safe, they are also unsafe. You know, we have borrowed these provisions from both the constitution, constitution of India and constitution of USA. There is no constitution in India, but they have a bill of rights and the rule of law. You know, very simple thing they say, in rule of, the say, rule of law, they say that nobody is above law in that country. And everybody should be ensured with liberty, equality like that. But it's not written. You know, you would be happy to know that in our constitution we have made uh, a law that anybody who is arrested must be produced before the magistrate within 24 hours. There is no law in the email, but that happens. Although it will not be good. And these fundamental rights, as I said, why we say that we are safe? Because very elaborate. Maximum care has been taken by the government, by the people, by the makers of the constitution, particularly uh, Dr. B.R. Ambedkar, as we are discussing. She was very concerned about the rights of minorities, rights of civil cause, rights of civil crime. And we have lots of different opinions, I have not tried to elaborate now. Lot of different opinion with Paniji, Panit Nehru, with everybody. Because we are not suspect, because uh, his religion was not given to him. Even if he become a say, central minister and elected. But that is not the thing. Why they are unsafe? Why they like that? You know, emergency. All of us, our people of India, they remain unsafe. Whatever the government wanted to do it, in the meantime, they clamped the press. They clamped many rights. Very distinguished persons like Dr. Pragas and Dr. Hipstamata. They were taken to the jail without notice, without anything. I remember, bit by bit, the development of that time. How they have the function, how the freedom of press was stopped, how the students were denied not to raise any question. Everywhere there was a great crime. So if fundamental rights are there, how the people remain unsafe? That was not supposed to be studied because otherwise there is no meaning. And in India, you know, I always uh, accept her as a very great prime minister, great lady, and respect. But about emergency, she has not been correct. Uh, nicely, you have analyzed. Uh our constitution and uh, how it functions and how it ensures good governance and everything. Uh, Professor Dora, we find that uh, the constitution, when we talk about constitution, we are reminded about directive principles of state policy. So what are the ideologies and principles uh, incorporated into uh, the directive principles of state policy? So there are some uh, principles. We can say it as the directives or additional principles which have been incorporated in part 4 of Indian constitution. Keeping in view the ideas of a welfare state. So all other countries of the world, they have thought of making their country or to take their country into a welfare state. India equally also it has thought of developing the country or it will need to have a welfare state. When we are talking about a welfare state, we are thinking about the development of the state, side by side development of the people also. Particularly in the directive principles of state policy, though these are not enforceable by the court, 
So these are some principles led to the people towards their conscience, both for the state and also to the people. These are in form of certain directives. Socialist principles, Gandhian principles, and some liberal principles, they all contain the directive principles of state policy. When we are talking about the socialist principle, so our constitutional makers, they thought of developing or uplifting the downtrodden people to make power with other people. Under socialism, when we are talking about socialism, we are talking about equality. So in that case, the poorer section of people, the liberal class of people are taking about equal pay for equal wages. We are thinking about the women laborers, about their children, about their all of development, education, health, all these. But under the socialistic principles, these directives, they are meant to uplift the downtrodden people, the poorer section of the people. And in the Gandhian ideology or Gandhian, certain Gandhian ideologies has also been incorporated in our directive principles of state policy. So most of the countries nowadays, they feel the relevance of Gandhism nowadays and also they are ready to accept on Gandhian ideologies and they are also incorporating into their provisions also. Equally while making our Indian constitution, our constitutional papers, they have incorporated certain Gandhian ideology into the directive principles of state policy. Like the formation of Gramma Panchayat, or about the cottage industries, so abolition of cow slaughter, like ban on alcoholic drinks and drugs. So these Gandhian ideologies, they have been clearly, vividly described in our directive principles of state policy. Under liberal ideology, liberal principles, so you want our constitutional makers thought of separating the executive from the legislature or for one civil court. So, generally these principles in form of the directives have been incorporated to make India, to lead India into a welfare state. Indeed, all these things lead India, India into a welfare state. You are right, uh, Dr. Dora. Uh, Dr. Das, we find that uh, a right without a remedy is absolutely a meaningless uh, concept. Uh, how do you accept it? I totally agree on the view that uh, the rights which are devoid of any remedy are actually meaningless. What I find very interesting is that in the Indian constitution, the rights are actually granted to the citizens. And who will protect that right? If it is at all violated, who will protect that? Under the constitution, in the fundamental rights section, in the last uh, of fundamental rights, it is clearly mentioned that there, there should be a right to constitutional remedies. Under Article 32 of Indian constitution, you, a citizen can directly approach to the court for violation of fundamental rights. You just cannot violate uh, the fundamental rights uh, for any other shape. So uh, according to Article 226 of Indian Constitution, a citizen can directly approach to the high courts, respective high, high courts. And there are rights like uh, constitutional remedies like obvious corrupts, mind damage, quarant, uh, or prohibition. These are all act as the soul of the constitution and if at all, I, I want to quote Dr. B.R. Ambedkar on that. If you don't accept these rights and if you don't uh, make it a remedy, then it is a nullity. So, it is considered to be a panacea or the soul of the fundamental rights. Actually, everything lies with the remedies. You just granted all the rights. But in case of a failure to adopt and to enforce it, so court is there to enforce it. Court is there to see that actually the citizens are not devoid of these rights. These are actually uh, what I find very interesting and in a positive side. Uh, though negatively you can go to the court of law, in positive side you have always the arm. Uh, when, whenever your uh, freedom is in jeopardy, then you can go directly to the court and get a reprieve. So by that way the remedy uh, is uh, absolutely fine with the Indian constitution without which the fundamental rights would, uh, would not have been uh, considered to be so fundamental for the citizen of this country. Uh, nicely you have uh, analyzed. Uh, Major Mahanti, we find that uh, our constitution has adapted itself uh, with the changes uh, over the years, over the time. 
and uh, how has it happened yeah, and so far as uh, a welfare uh, state is concerned how the constitution has adapted itself with the changes constitution has adapted many provisions to make india a welfare state that will come people have welcomed it because it's a people's constitution in the constitution one thing we are forgetting well i have mentioned earlier we say we ensure popular sovereignty Power belongs to people in our country. So welfare state is ensured. But I am afraid by implementing a welfare state theory or in practice, we forget about the rights of the people many times. We court planning. The government will say it is necessary for the planning, we'll have to sacrifice. It is necessary for certain things, we'll have to sacrifice. So in the name of planning, in the name of development, in the name of welfare states, our rights are jeopardized. Rights are not ensured. That is a very important thing. But that should be liberally viewed. Government should be thanked. Government is taking some welfare measures and amending the constitution like that because you know, um, 127 times we have amended the constitution. Everything. And what I will tell you that in our constituent assembly, we have forgotten to consider it earlier. The Roman members, Marathi Chogri of our state, she was a member. Many distinguished ladies were their members, but women empowerment was not. They thought of Chukka, Sultrai, Mayati, but nobody thought of this women empowerment. So that is the point. What I want to emphasize. These are the things which the future generations, future politicians, they must take care. Otherwise, we will be nowhere. I yeah. told you that in the name of planning, in the name of developmental work, we are forgetting the people. They are behind us. Yes. These aspects should not be forgotten. Yes, right. Uh, Dr. Dora, uh, what are the salient features? of uh, federalism. So far as federalism is uh, concerned, we consider India to be a uh, proper federal state. And what is your opinion and what are the salient features of federalism? So it is said that Indian constitution is a borrowed constitution. Borrowed constitution in the sense that our constitutional makers, constitutional framers, so they have examined the constitution of other countries. So while implementing uh, federalism in India, they experienced the federalism of American constitution. America is the mother of federalism. While incorporating ideas of federalism, our constitutional maker, so did not directly implemented the exact pattern of federalism, which is followed in America. That is not exactly followed in India. So they have, there is a detailed discussion on that. And after thorough discussion, so there is, according to the suitability of India, so federalism or you know, federalism has been incorporated or India, they have wanted to make India into a federal state. When we are talking about federalism or to make India into a federal state, we are thinking that, so there should be clean division of power between the center and the states. While distributing the powers or not, it is exactly unlike the American constitution or constitution of Switzerland. But in particular, India, when we think about to make a, you know, to make a country a federal state, at least we must have four features, basically. Number one, the state must have a written constitution. In India, our, our constitution is a written constitution, is a codified constitution. Number two, there must be two sets of government. We have a central government and state governments also. Number three, so there should be clear division of power, decentralization of power. Decentralization of power is the main motto, main ideology of federalism. In Indian style, so we have distributed the powers into three lists. A list system is followed in India, unlike union list, state list and concurrent list. Different items or subjects have been distributed. Some powers, like 97 items, have been given to the central government to make law for that. So, government of India or union government, it is free to make laws on 97 items. 
and the state governments cannot interfere while making the laws over the union lists. Equally, the state governments have been empowered to make law over the state subjects or 62 items which has been given to the state governments. And finally, both the union government and state government, so they used to make law over 52 items which is known as concurrent list. While making the law in, uh, over the concurrent list, even or if, if any dispute comes, any conflict comes between the center and the state, the decision of the center should be final. And finally, the idea of federalism says that there was to be an independent judiciary. And in India, we found these four features of federalism. But besides that, we feel that in practice, although there is a division of power, although there is a distribution of power, but we have made our center powerful, for which we speak it as a quasi-federal state. Professor Casey who has said it is a quasi-federal state because in the other side, we feel the unitarian characteristics in Indian constitution. So we have empowered, we have made powerful our central government. Now that the federating units or the state governments, so they are all combined in one chain. So as a whole, the federalism, are, as we speak about the centripetal federation or centrifugal federation, in Indian practice, our state governments, they are heading towards the center. They are dependent on the center. They are not away from the center. Always center keeps them into its fold. That's why Satna also, although federal characteristics are found, unitarian nature is also seen. So we speak it is federal in form, but it is unitary in spirit. That is what about federalism, federal pattern in Indian context. You have rightly analyzed federalism and in the context of India, how federalism uh, has been a success. Uh, Dr. Das, uh, we find that uh, since the adoption of our uh, constitution, we have been facing, we have been encountering with number of challenges. And is there any provision of emergency suspension of fundamental rights? Yes, it is beautiful to analyze that the concept of suspension of fundamental rights. We do have certain emergency provisions. In that case, we can suspend some of the rights. But we cannot suspend the right to life or right to liberty. In ordinary cases, we can uh, check on the speech but we cannot uh, make a uh, violation in the right to life or liberty. So, of course, there is provision for certain changes or certain restrictions, but the basic kind of things you just cannot change in the name of emergency. Emergency provisions are there, but it is not that the whole individual liberty and the right to life can be taken away. So by that way, we feel that the constitution is fully safeguarding the best interest of the citizen of this country. And we salute this kind of uh, uh, emotion that is actually expressed in the language or you can say in the codified form. And that is the beauty. Thank you. Uh, Professor Mohanty, we find that you have been regularly contributing articles to different uh, newspapers. And most of your articles focus on Indian constitution, uh, the preamble and uh, the use of uh, this constitution, the relevance of this of our constitution in our daily life and other matters also. So what are your personal views uh, on our constitution? You know, I, previously I have already said that I like the constitution, I respect it. It is a second day because it is a bad day of and all that, but the constitution. I would like to insist on another point. I feel very secure when I know as part of the constitution, Supreme Court is guiding the constitution. That is a great thing. The people of India should not feel exploited or harassed or disregarded because they have a very important instrument. They can walk into the Supreme Court without paying the fees also. They can draw the attention of the judges that they are fundamental rights. That anything is taken away. They are going to rest. Although there is a controversy when Somnath Sarah is a great CPM leader, you are the speaker of the Lok Sabha, he has died now. 
he was quarrelling with Supreme Court. He was telling that Supreme Court is giving guidance to Parliament. This is advantage. Supreme Court's advantage. But I do not agree to it. He is a great man. He has fought for the rights of the people. But unless somebody is guardian, if you read the newspaper these days, and where you are celebrating the 75th Amrit Mahotsav of Independence, the, 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 the Supreme Court is very assisting in many ways. Any issue, Supreme Court is gone, threatening the state government, central government, any man in the politics, everything. I will not give examples because that will be politicking. But this is the thing. So this is all. Thank you very much. Nicely you have analyzed uh, Major Mahanti. And now, uh, Professor Dora, we find that uh, India is guided by the law and the constitution ensures the laws. What are the sources of uh, our law? When we think about law or its sources, constitution is the main source of law. So any law, in its making, it must not contravene to our constitution. Indian laws are known as constitutional laws. We give priority, importance to the constitution. So constitution is the main source of law. Besides the constitution, we have customs, we have traditions, we have many parliamentary legislations, judicial decisions, so all these are the sources of law. Uh, thank you. Uh, Dr. Das, uh, uh, could you please mention a particular amendment uh, which has changed uh, the course of life in India so far as the rural people are concerned? Yes, um, amendments are very much important for a constitution. If you want to change and to make it lively, you need to change the constitution and sometimes the provisions also. So what happened? Gandhi always pleaded for a village Swaraj and as a result of which it was already incorporated in the direct principles of state policy for uh, the Panchayatira system. But what happened? After 73rd constitutional amendment uh, in the year 1993 it is actually promulgated. So what happened? The villagers, they were granted power and decentralization to the grassroots has been sanctioned. And by the way, they have been involved in the polity of the state. By that way, the uh, village people, they feel proud that we are part of the system and the system is with us and we are moving around the state with the system, with Panchayati Raj as the hallmark of this development. So, the, uh, I can particularly uh, narrate this uh, particular amendment, the 73rd constitutional amendment, is much more relevant in case of India, where actually 70% uh, constitutes villages. And we do have respect for this constitutional amendment. Thank you. Indeed, our constitution protects our rights and safeguards our uh, responsibility and ensures our duty for the nation. It ensures that public opinion is respected, personal liberty is granted, opinion of minorities are tolerated and all sorts of humanitarian activities are promoted. That is why we celebrate uh, this Constitution Day uh, with uh, a lot of enthusiasm uh, all over the country and to uh, commemorate it, different activities are being undertaken by the Government of India and in different states as well. The constitution uh, related activities are made and uh, uh, there has been run for equality to uh, to just uh, spread the spirit of Banhomi, to spread the spirit of liberty, equality and fraternity and the special session of the parliament is also uh, called for. So, so many activities are made and under Eastern Journal Cultural Centre under the Ministry of uh, Government of uh, Ministry of Culture, Government of India, this particular session, this deliberation is organized and it gives a very positive message and it uh, facilitates what is our constitution and how, what are the features of constitution, what are the activities of constitution, how constitution safeguards and ensures the fundamental rights and everything which uh, has been discussed and uh, well deliberated by our experts, by our uh, panelists. Uh, we are extremely thankful to you sir for your uh, presence and for your deliberation and for your very uh, nice analysis, very splendid analysis on different issues concerning our constitution. Thank you. Thank you.